right, you guys, it's episode 65 of Inner Demons. And like always, I'm going to get straight to it. But before I do, let me just say this real quick. So like I always say at the beginning of these episodes, whether it's redundant or not, some of you, I always go through the comments. I read all the comments. I try to answer some of you. And again, I'm very appreciative of those of you that have been dropping positive comments, even those of you that have been dropping constructive criticism. That's what I'm going to call it. You know, some of you are critical, you know what I mean? But my skin is thick. I can take it. Even some of the questions that some of you tell me, B, box, don't answer that. You know what I mean? That that guy's, you know what I mean? That he's trolling or whatever. I still, you know, I'm an open book. If there's something that I feel that needs some clarity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it. So, you know, unless it's just some, some juvenile adolescent type of a, a trolling where somebody's just being disrespectful, something like that. I'm not going to respond to something like that. How can I respond to the negative comments when I'm not responding to all the positive comments? So it is what it is, man. Anyways, episode 64. At the end of episode 64, I told you guys that I had just been called out for an unexpected court appearance. Basically, they called me down there and it was for the purpose of consolidating my case with John Santa Ana, Roger Carranza, and Jose Perez. They consolidated our cases. They gave me a new criminal complaint, and they amended some more charges. Now, the only other charges that I remember them amending at that point were the three charges that I, already, I believe I already told you guys, and that was the being in possession of $25,000 that was derived from criminal activity. Then there was the conspiracy charge, and then there was also the participating in a criminal street gang. That was a separate charge itself. I already had enhancements, gang enhancements, 186.22s for every charge they charged me for, even the, even the weed. <laughs> they charged me with a, a gang enhancement for the weed, a 10-year gang enhancement. Anyway, it was overkill. But that was the purpose for taking me to court. Now, let me just say this. Now, with regards to my housing, I really didn't expect nothing to change with respect to where, where they housed me at in the county jail based on the fact that I knew that this outside agency had pretty much, you know, they put shit in the game. They told them that, you know, I was going to cause all kind of chaos in their county jail, that I had a lot of influence. So I pretty much expected to be in the, in the observation cell for the long haul. I wasn't expecting to go nowhere. And honestly... You know, I wanted to be around the homies. That's where I wanted to be. But the observation cell really wasn't that bad because after a while, after I, you know, after a good three weeks of being there, getting to know the officers that worked in Second East, they started blessing me. They started looking out with ODR food. Some of them would give me extra lunches. So I was getting spoiled. I was getting my weight back on over there. So, you know, I, I wanted to move, but it just, I figured it wasn't going to happen. So, you know, I was just like, whatever happens, happens. Anyways, after I make this court appearance, they escort me back through the jail tunnels. And when you come over to, when you when you go through the tunnels and you get into the old jail, there's two elevators over there. One is the elevator that they use for Second West, which is the elevator I had gotten used to, you know, using because when you go up to the second deck right there, you make a right in the observation cell is right there in second east. The other elevator is for second west. Well, both of them are kind of like for second west, but this one right here, it puts you like right directly, right by area 51. As soon as you get off that elevator, you make a hard right and area 51 ad seg is right there. So when, when they're escorting me through the tunnel, I post up in front of the elevator and they're like, you know, they keep, they kept on walking and they're like, Hey, come on, let's go. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't register it at first what's going on. I'm thinking, okay, maybe the elevators broke down or they're not using it or something, whatever. So I follow them to the other elevator and they take me up that elevator. So when we get on the elevator, that's when one of the seals told me you're not housed over there no more. They moved you. You were moved while you were in court. So I'm like, where the hell did they move me to, right? So I don't ask them. I just, 
I'm like, all right, whatever, man. You know, I'm thinking maybe they're going to put me up on the fourth floor or they're going to put me on one of the max tiers. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. So I get off the elevator and right there, I already knew where AdSay was because every time I would go out for the shower, you know, I had asked about it in the past and they, the COs, they told me it's right there. It's like kitty cat to where the podium is, right across from the snake pit. So when I got off the elevator, boom, we make a hard right. And I'm like, cool, they're putting me in. And I say, you know, I'm going to go back there with Joe and Chopo from Watsonville. And, you know, it's it's got to be a better situation than where I'm at. I, like I said, I started to get comfortable, but I wasn't tripping. I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to get back on the tier and be around the homies. So, you know, they, this is the first time, obviously, that I, I go to AdSeg. I've heard about AdSeg in the past, in the years, back in the 92 indictments. I heard about all the, you know, the security tiers, the the, the super maxes, the little maxes, the ad segs. So this is the first time that, you know, I'm getting to see ad seg. And like I said, I've heard about it before. And you go through, so there's a solid door that you guys should be seeing right now. There's that solid door right there with the little red sign on it. And it says area 51 that's written on it. And then you go through that door, there's a gate. There's a gate right there. And then there's another gate. And then you walk on to a tier and it's just a little small tier. There's four cells and a shower. They got a TV that's on a roll cart and then they have a phone that's on a roll cart. Now, all four doors, they're all solid doors. They got a little tray slot on them so that, you know, when you use the phone or they serve you, they can pop the slot open and reach through. Aside from that, the only thing I can think of is that really is relevant about that tier is that they have big plate glass windows in front of every, each cell has a big window. It's just a big plate glass window that, you know, and it's, it's cool as far as like, if you want to watch TV or you're just peeping the scene on the tier. So that's, that's pretty much how Little Max is set up. Now we're blocked off from the rest of the jail. Like literally, if you got health issues in your house back there, you're done. Because just to get a phone change, we used to have to yell for like 20, 30 minutes at the top of our lungs just to get them back there because they can't hear you. We're behind a solid door. And you guys got to understand, this is a county jail. It's loud. So imagine those cops being behind the podium and hearing us yell back there for a phone change when they have the snake pits right there. There's all kinds of, of traffic right there in second west. So we were stuck. We're stuck back there. Now, later on, I would find out being back there that there was another housing unit behind us and there was a door and it was kind of like around the corner in the back. But it was, you know, we could hear them back there, but we never really thought we would ever establish contact with anybody. We were buried under the jail. So it was kind of hard to run the jail being right there in AdSeg. Now, Joe was doing it. Joe Abeda was doing it. But it was hit and miss. You know, they had a, a setup to where they would go out on the yard and there was a spot out there where they would put the kites and the snake pits would retrieve them. And, you know, they vice versa. They would drop a response or you know, the incoming paperwork that they had going to AdSeg and it would be back there on the yard in one of the little poles, inside one of the little, a hollow pole. So, you know, it worked, but it was, in my opinion, it was risky to do that because all it took was for one CO to be out there or, you know, an inmate to stroll the yard or something and it just, you know, reach down and, and fill in that little pole right there and boom, they would end up you know, breaching secu our, our security. So it was risky, but that was the only the only way that they could do it. You know, being back there, I realized that there wasn't really too many other options. We didn't have any other kind of movement besides lawyer visits and things like that. Otherwise, yard was the best opportunity and that's what they were doing. So anyways, I get escorted back to AdSeg and, and I'm just happy to be around the homies. I'm I'm already feeling my morale. You know, my morale's coming back already, just being on the tier. I haven't even seen these fools yet.
I know they're on the tier. And we come through that last gate. I can already see him on the windows. And I see Joe. I see Joe on the window. And he's smiling. And, you know, I walk by all inconspicuous. Like, I don't even want to say nothing because I'm like, these fools, you know, they don't want me back here. I don't want to say nothing. Act like, you know, I got just, I don't want to say nothing in front of the seals. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, get in the cell, and let them get up out of there. You know, that's how traumatized they had me. I, I thought, you know, my thinking was they probably just throw me back in the observation cell if they even thought I had too much, too much influence. Anyways, so, you know, as soon as the CO uncuffs me and he walks off the tier, shuts all the doors, I want to say for like the rest of the day, before I even clean the cell, we start chopping it up. You know, they want to hear about everything that happened. They had heard that we got raided. They heard that, you know, I was busted. You know how the COs are in, in any jail, in any prison. The COs are, are, they're the biggest gossipers. They're the ones that facilitate all the, the, the information. Somebody comes in, somebody that's high profile, somebody gets arrested, something happens, somebody gets jumped on, somebody gets beat up, somebody gets stabbed. They're the first ones to get on their cell phone and relay it to another CO or just popping up on the tier and letting the fellas know. So, you know, at some point they heard that I was in the jail and they heard I was in the observation cell, but they couldn't get nothing back there to me. I want to say they, they sent one package through a CO that I had walk over there and pick it up. But other than that, it was hard to get anything from there to where I was at. So for a brief time, I depended on, on Angel. You know, the thing I didn't get to tell you guys is even that was short-lived because at one point, you know, Angel shot me his girl's phone number and I would call her and she would relay messages to Angel that I couldn't really relay to him through the door or things that I really didn't want to put, you know, on paper and in a book and hand it to a CO to give to him when he came out for chow. They ended up moving Angel because he was communicating with me. I want to say they moved him and like three other homies that were always with them. Every time they'd walk by, what's up, B? So they seen them communicating. And as soon as they seen that, within a couple of days, they were gone. So, you know, I get back there and, and for a good three, four hours, I'm just, I'm, you know, telling Joe and, and Chopo how it happened, how I got raided and, you know, I go through the whole scenario, everything that happened. And, you know, I want to put it out there so that they can help. They can help me try to figure out who it is that told on us. Somebody told on us that obviously led to these raids. I couldn't figure it out. I had a couple ideas, but at that point, I didn't know who it was. So, you know, I, I put everything out there step-by-step step detail, you know, who I met here, who I met there, who might have had a, who might have had an agenda, you know, who had a motive and, you know, everything kept coming back to Ladigo. Ladigo, if you're watching this, hey, bro, I'm sorry, homie. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, bro. But based on everything that happened, that's just, everything was pointing back to you, bro. And, and, I will say that I never seen anything that said that it was you. I'll say that I've been knowing you for a long time. You know, we were back there on that six yard together back in the early nineties. And even though things happen towards the end of my run out there, you know, it is what it is, bro. But I felt like you could have done more too to, to, to step up and let it be known that, Hey, you know, it wasn't you, man, because I know you heard that a lot of people were pointing their fingers at you, man. Um, you know, I got that police report that I told you guys about, and it was like a 30 page police report and like 30 pages were redacted. That right there was that was just the last straw that was just like, it's got to be logical, you know. But again, I want it to be clear that I have never seen nothing with logical's name on it. There's nothing definitive that I can say, you know what, I know it was him. There's just, there's some things that point in that direction, but I'm speculating, you know, I'm speculating. So 
unfortunately, you know, I didn't put that, I didn't put it out there, you know, I didn't filter it out when I was still active. I didn't put it out there that, you know, Ladigo is the one that's, that's, that's telling because that's not the way I operate. That's not the way that I've usually operated, you know, but, you know, we had to investigate. We had to look into certain things. So, you know, I hope you understand, bro. I hope you understand. If it was you, you know what I mean? Cold piece of work. If it wasn't, you got to understand the situation was what it was, man. And, you know, there wasn't too many other possibilities that, that were jumping out at, at me, at least. And other people that were familiar with the case, everybody was like, man, he had a motive. You know, he had a reason to get rid of you. We're going to take his truck and his bike. He's the last one that came by your house. If these cops kicked the door in, if they got a search warrant signed on the 4th, but didn't actually execute that search warrant until the 11th, meaning they sat on it for a week. Common sense tells me that if these cops want to raid a house and they got it signed on the 4th and they wait a week, during that week, they're taking a chance of maybe there not being no dope in the house. Maybe the dope gets moved or maybe the guns and, and the weapons get moved. You're taking a chance, waiting a whole week, maybe to come up empty. So if I waited, if I was a cop and I waited a week, I would want to make sure that when I did kick that door in, that there was something in place. And the way to do that would be by sending somebody in the house to physically see it. So that's, you know, that's another thing that was just, it was, it was something I couldn't get away from. Anyways, let me move on, man, because... You know, in all fairness, to a lot of go, I know what it feels like, bro, to be, you know, to have allegations waged against you when it's not true. But it's part of the story. And, you know, it's something that happened. We we were speculating that it might have been you. Anyways, so, you know, I, I, I spent half a day going through everything that happened with these guys. I'm still not 100%. I'm still kind of going through it. But now I really got to hide you know, any kind of, any kind of symptoms, any kind of signs that, that I'm going through withdrawals. I got a C that's next to me, Chopo from Watsonville. And I got a beta, you know, a beta that's, that's been around. I've been knowing a beta for years. We were up in Pelican Bay together. And it's not that these guys had, you know, any kind of status over me or nothing like that, it's, but they're part of the team. And, you know, they find out about it, you know, eventually, they're going to be obligated to report that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I try to keep it under wraps, but, you know, I, I still had a hard time trying to trying to sleep and just trying to get regular again. It took about a good 30 days. So, you know, after about a good two weeks that I was there, I finally started to, to get healthy again. I finally started to take all extras, <laughs> take all extra lunches, all extra breakfasts, anything and everything to get my health back. I started working out again. We started busting down, doing machina. There was also another homeboy that was there. So there was four of us that were on that on that tier. There was four cells. So it was Joel Beta, it was Chopo from Watsonville, and then there was another homeboy, Silent, not Bobby Lopez, Silent Arias. His last name was Arias. I can't remember his first name, but he's from San Jose. And this is another guy that I met in San Quentin doing a parole violation. He was out there on the six yard with this good old boy. You know, he was waiting to go to the feds for deportation issues. So, you know, that first day was it was just about catching up, man. It was just like it was a lightweight reunion back there. You know, it had been years since I seen Chopo. It had been years since I seen Joe, although I was talking to him on a daily out there on the streets. You know, let me let me emphasize that again or let me clarify that again for the viewers that obviously thought that I was communicating with Joe in the county jail with a cell phone. I don't know how that got misconstrued, but I didn't have a cell phone in the county jail when I was talking about communicating with Joe by way of phone. It was when I was on the streets, you know, going all the way back to I don't know what episode I talked about how I established those lines of contact through model. Mato was one of my regiment members that got caught up, went to the jail, went in there with, 
good good intentions trying to run the jail because he was associated with me just went in there and straight just try to start calling shots implemented policies when there was somebody already lightweight doing that when joe joe beta was already he was already running the jail but then it became official when you know i had model pass my number to joe and joe would call me from adset now the thing that's interesting that I never heard about, I never heard nothing about this, and I never even really thought about it before. It didn't come up in my case. It didn't come up in discovery. Is Joe had been calling me for at least a good, I want to say at least a good two months before I got arrested. He was calling me on the same phone that we got caught up on. But I don't know. I don't, I want to say, or I want to, you know, I'm assuming that they weren't really on the phone like they were. Once I got there, that's when they were all over everything. The mail, the phone, but they never never brought nothing up. You know what I'm saying? I would think that, you know, because of the way Santa Clara County was, and I told you guys, the gang intel officers, how involved they were. Wonder why they were never monitoring, monitoring the phones when Joe was back there calling me. So that's that's something that stands out to me that I never really thought about is, how come they weren't monitoring the phones back there when when Joe was calling me? I don't know, you know, because from the time that I got arrested up until for the next 10 years, I never seen nothing different other than them gang intel officers being on the phones all over the jail. The fourth floor, you know, Elmwood. Any any housing unit that was considered to be active, they were on those phones. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they were, but maybe it wasn't relevant to the case at the time. Joe wasn't a part of the case at that time. So maybe they were recording it. Maybe they did have knowledge of the fact that Joe was calling me. I don't know, but it never came up. It was never discussed in my discovery. Nothing like that. So anyways... You know, over the next two or three weeks, I'm starting to get my health back. But also, I told you guys that, you know, being in the observation cell, going through the withdrawals, it, it put me in a, in, a, in a different place. Being back on the tier with the homies, being back around them again, having that camaraderie again, it almost immediately boosted my morale. It was almost immediate. As soon as I hit that tier, you know, I was back amongst the fellas again. And a part of me almost felt like I needed to get back with them because these guys were trying to get at me and I wanted to get away from that. You know, it, it's, 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 it might sound crazy, but that's how I was feeling. I just, I wanted to get back on the tier with the fellas and fight my case, concentrate on my case. I knew I was going to be there for a long time. I knew I was going to be fighting that case. This wasn't something that was just going to go away. So, you know, I started digging into the law books almost immediately. I was one of the only ones that had search and seizure issues because I wasn't on parole. So a lot of my rights were restored. They couldn't just kick my door in without probable cause. A lot of these other guys were on parole, so they were able to get around that. That would justify their search. They could go search any of their houses under a parole search that would justify it. So they didn't need search and seizure issues. Once I got off paper, once I was no longer on parole, I had all my rights back. So I knew that, and this is when I started digging into the books as far as, you know, looking as, as far back as Impala, because they were trying to use the Impala search as justification for kicking in my, my door on Beecher Court, the new house that I was living at. They basically used the search. They used the the you know, everything that they found, the fruits of that search, all the the contraband, the gang paraphernalia, the drug paraphernalia, everything that they found over there, the fact that it was a shootout, they used all that on the face of the search warrant. And the other thing that they used was contained within the, the sealed portion of the search warrant. That I couldn't see. I, I can't fight what I can't see. All I knew was that it was a confidential informant that had provided information in the past on several occasions about people that were considered high level drug dealers. They were dealing in, you know, in increments or amounts over a pound. So this sucker was reliable. And 
I couldn't fight that. The only way that you're going to fight something like that is to challenge it in court, go through like a Revis hearing, go through all the motions, and then you go in and, and you ask a judge to go in and look at the sealed portion and make a determination on whether or not this was you know, probable cause that would justify this new search. And come on, you know, nine times out of 10. So the judges, they become nothing more than like rubber stamps for these types of things. They look at a search warrant, they're almost always going to sign off on it or say that there was justification to search. So I knew it was going to be a long fight. I knew I was going to be there for a while. But again, never did I ever think I was going to be there for 10 years. So, you know, over the next two, three, four months were there in ADSEG and the morale is continuing to build. I'm, I'm better now. You know, I got my feet back under me. I got my strength back, my wits. Now I'm, you know, I'm dismissive about any kind of phone calls where, you know, if I call my mom, she starts talking about cooperating, I shut her down. You know, I'm like, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that stuff, you know, this phone is, it's bad business. You're going to get me caught up. The same thing with Vicky, you know, with her, I was a little bit more, I was still trying to keep her pacified a little bit more, you know, as far as, look, I already, I already told you what I would do if it comes to that, you know, but I got to go through the motions and it's going to take a little bit of time. You got to understand that it's going to take some time. I can't rush through the courts. I got a bunch of code defendants and everything is, it's done and, it, you know, it's a process. So, you know, I kept her believing that if things went, you know, things fell wayside, that I would do what I had to do. Although, again, like I told you guys, it was just to keep her well. I don't have to lie about it. What's done is done. Nothing's going to change it. And again, my whole purpose for telling you guys this is not to win anybody's approval. It's nothing like that. It's nothing's going to change I'm well aware of, of the circumstances. I'm not, I'm not dumb. You know, I want you guys to understand, especially those of you that are still active, what kind of politics I was up against, what they did. And, and, you know, we talk about things like due process and giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. And it was cutthroat politics. And it was at every level over there. And the cool part about it is I've never been that type of seat. I've always given other homeboys the benefit of the doubt. I was one that would help somebody rather than, if I seen somebody was drowning, I throw them a life vest or I pull them out of the water. I try to help them. I wouldn't just watch them sink or I wouldn't throw a rock on them and, and, and hope that they would sink. That's what the homies were doing. And it, you know, I'm not over here crying about it. It is what it is, man. And if you guys think I'm wrong at the end of this series, when you hear about everything that happened, I'm talking about everything, then, okay, I'll take that in stride. I don't think you guys are going to make those conclusions after you get all the details. Just trust me on that. So anyways, I want to keep emphasizing how much, you know, being back on the tier, being around the homies, how, how much of an impact it had on me. Not only was my morale up, but... You know, it got to the point to where we started feeding off each other's energy, where we were like, you know what, I don't give a fuck what happens. We're going to do life. You know, we we had that mentality back there. We had that that mindset of we're in trouble and it's going to continue to get worse. And it just keeps continuing to get worse. More people are getting added on to this case. And hopefully they'll send us to the feds. If I'm going to do life, we wanted to go to the feds. That's where Corny and everybody was at at that time. And we, all of us back there were like, you know what? Hopefully the feds pick it up. I don't care. You know, I don't care if this is, if this turns into a life case, fuck it. You know what I mean? It is what it is. But that's, that was how dangerous it was to be back around the homies again. That's, that's how fast, you know, my, my mentality changed. And I think, you know, for that one viewer that said, you don't think it would make a difference whether you were in an observation cell or whether you were on a tier with the with the fellas. Again, I think you're you're wrong. And I'm not making assumptions. I'm telling you that because that's the type of effect that it had on me. Anyways. So. You know, time's going on back there. Time is, is passing by before, you know, it, we're back there. It's like six months and. You know, at one point, I talked about it in one of my war stories. I ended up getting into it with one of the COs back there. 
Anyways, dude was walking me around like a dog, you know, turn here, get over there, step over here, walk on this side of the line, do that, do this, jump up, jump on one foot. And I flashed on him. One thing led to another. Before you know it, we were tussling in front of my cell, broke the TV, and he hit the panic button. And then they came in, dogpiled me, took me downstairs. Excuse me. Put me in a, they put me in a, a what are those cells, those, a padded cell. It's like a, a <laughs> and they put J cats in there, but they put me in there because I was fighting. They brought me in. Obviously, I was cuffed. I was shackled. They dogpiled me again on the ground, and then they cut my clothes off. And then, you know, I was telling them, man, I was mad. I was highly upset, probably foaming at the mouth like a dog. But I had told them, I'm like, you motherfuckers better get up and run up out of here as fast as you can, because as soon as the last one of you gets off my back, I'm jumping up and somebody's going to get it. And I did. But they got up and they got up out of there quick. All of them piled out and turned around real fast and they all piled up against the door. Boom, slammed the door. And there I am standing there like a J cat for about six hours, butt naked. So I told you guys what happened after that. You know, they didn't put me in the observation cell. They ended up bringing me back to ad say, they just, there's nothing that they really could have did. I want to say that they gave me, they wrote me up, took my commissary or whatever they did. It was something that was insignificant. It didn't even affect me. But, you know, that incident ended up happening. And then there's some other incidents that are going to happen. But I'm going to tell you guys that in other episodes. So, you know, for the next, for the next two, three months, it's just, me, Chopo, and Silencio. So eventually, at one point, they ended up shipping Silencio up. He ends up catching a bus, and he goes to the feds on his deportation issues. So coincidentally, when they ship out Silencio, they bring down the individual that was Mondo's target, the guy that Mondo got killed stabbing. They brought him down. He was there with us for about, I want to say, a good two months. And then... They brought some other cat down from Gilroy, some dude named Disco. And eventually they bring Pony in. But I'm going to talk about that in another episode because there's things that I want to detail about how he came in, what he did. But let me just let me just say this before I close this up. Yeah, everything's got to come to an end. At one point, you know, I'm caught up with, with everything that's happening on the streets. I tell Joe and Chopo about everything that happened out there. And, you know, they're like, man, bro, it's a mess. You know, you know, what 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 kind of case isn't a mess that has multiple defendants in these kind of gang cases? So, yeah, it was a mess. There was a lot of people involved. There was a lot of things going on that I didn't know about at that time that I would find out about later. And these cases, they they play out like they do anywhere. This this case played out just like all these other indictment cases play out. Somebody cooperates, somebody tries to, to jump on the best deal from the, from the beginning. You got people that just go all out and just start just dumping on people for things that they don't even really need to talk about, but they just, they go all in and just try to bring everybody down. So, you know, this case, it wasn't no different. You know, in the beginning, there was a lot of people cooperating against me. There was Police reports that I was, you know, other North Daniels in the county jail were sending police reports to us down there that mentioned my name. And these were guys I didn't even know. They somehow thought I had something to do with everything that was going on within the county of Santa Clara. And that's no bullshit. They thought I was responsible for everything. They would get a, a shooting and somehow, some way they would try to find out if I had ordered that hit or if I was some way tied to these individuals and, you know, they were taking directives from me. It was crazy. It, it literally just, it was getting worse and worse and worse. So at one point, you know, I tell Joe and Chopo, really, you know, I, I throw it out there. I'm just like, look, man, I got a bunch of money out there on the streets that I, I need to get a hold of. You know, I, I got my girl out there. I got other things that, 
you know, I'm obligated to that. I just, I need to get this money off the streets, but I got no way of getting it. I can't get a hold of certain individuals and I'm stuck. I was at an impasse. I was like, bro, you know, if you know anybody that can, that can help me get that money, I split it with them. You know, there was at least 10 to $15,000 that was still left on the streets. You know, that's how I used to do it. When I was out there, I would get all the dope from Julio that we would get, whether it was 20, 30 pounds, whatever it was. And I would bag it all up in the ounces. And then I would just shoot it all out with the regiment. You know, some would get put away, obviously, but most of it would get shot out there to the different members. And, you know, they would come in, the money would come in at different times. So a lot of that money was still stuck out there. Some of it was getting dropped off. Some of it was being honored. There was a lot of good homies that were out there that were doing the right thing. Hey, be stuck. You know, we know he can't really communicate right now. So, you know, they reached out and made an effort to contact somebody that was in contact with my lady and they got that money to her. But there was still a lot of money that was still out there. So I throw it out there and, you know, Joe, he's like, hey, B, he goes, look, man, I got a primo that's out there. His name's Twist. He's like, he's a good dude. He's not really doing nothing out there. He's not working. He's got a bunch of free time on his hands. He's like, you know, if I can get him to get that money, you willing to split it with him? And I was, I, I told him, I was like, hell yeah. If he's willing to get that money off the streets, he's more than, than deserving of half of it. So yeah, if he can do it, you know, he can have half, bro. I just need to be abreast of everything that he's getting. And, you know, Joe already understood, you know, the seriousness of, you know, money when it comes to the regiment. There's there's bookkeeping. There's amounts that are accounted for. Money needs to go to certain places. So I let a, I let Joe know, Joe, look, man, the last thing I want to see is your cousin get caught up over some money. If he's picking money up from these individuals, make sure that you guys document it and that he records everything that he gets, who it's from. All that, bro, because I don't want to see him get caught up, you know, and, and he's trying to help me. So he's like, no, nah, I got you, B. You know, I got you, man. I'm like, bro, watch out how you talk on the phone, too, man. I'm like, I don't know if you guys got your codes down, but, you know, you guys are obviously going to be talking about a lot on the phone. So try, to, try not to be using names and things like that. And that's just common sense. At that time, I still didn't know that they were on the phones like that, but that's just common security right there like they're going to try to get this money for me and i know joe has to communicate all this to twist he's got to put it in his ear so that he understands what he's got to do what's involved and what to tell these individuals so my concern was how are you going to communicate all this to him without being just too open on the phone i didn't want my name mentioned i didn't want my lady's name mentioned you know i wanted them to be as discreet as possible so Joe assured me that he had it, that she was like, look, bro, I got it. Don't trip. You know what I mean? He's like, we'll take care of it. So the phone calls start. Joe gets on the phone. He's calling Twist. He breaks it down to Twist. Look, man, he's, you know, off top, there's an individual, Conejo, that's out there. He owes B $5,000. You got to get that money. You get it. There's $2,500 for you right there. So, you know, that was one of the first ones that he had made contact with. He ended up running into Bonet. We actually knew him. And, you know, on one occasion, he brought him by the house and we scheduled a phone call. And that was like the, one of the only times I got on the phone. Bonet was there and, you know, they shot the phone to me and, and I got on with them real quick. And I'm like, hey, bro, you know, just, I really don't want to talk on this phone too much, man, but just that that money, it needs to be taken care of, bro. Like next week, I need to get that from you next week. It's already been, you know, you've already had plenty of time. I've been gone for already over a month. So take care of that ASAP, bro. You know what I mean? And he assured me that he would. And at that point, Conejo wasn't in trouble. He really wasn't. All, all that I wanted him to do was to get that money and drop it off like he had committed to, like he was obligated to. So, you know, they're working on Conejo. They're working on some other individuals out there. 
there's a thousand here, fifteen hundred over here, three thousand over there. So he's out there working the streets, and you know he's he's plugging in the individuals, and and he runs into a couple cats that you know helped him get in touch with a lot of the guys that I was that was working under me out there that were part of the regiment that didn't get raided. So you know, there I'm trusting in Joe that. He's being discreet on the phone. I'm in the cell next to him, but I really can't hear everything that he's saying. He's not talking loud. You know, he got the phone receiver <clears throat> in his tray slot. He's leaning down the tray slot. That's how you use the phone back there. And, you know, a lot of the conversations, I can't hear him. I know he's on the phone and he'll get off and then he'll communicate. Hey, you know, that was my primo B. He's like, look, he just ran into such and such. He's, you know, he took care of this. He, he managed to get 1500 from this individual. So I'm like, cool, bro. Right. Cool. So this is what you, I want you guys to understand too, before I wrap this up. So Joe was, he had been in the County for about three or four years at that point when I came in and, you know, he was fighting a three strike case. It was a, it was a weak case, but still it was like a simple dope case, but they still, they charged him with possession for sale and they hit him with his third strike. He had been there for four years. He went to a Romero hearing and he actually beat it. He won. He persevered in the, in the Romero hearing. So they dropped the third strike, which made him eligible to, you know, he came out with something cool. I want to say it was like four years. So within a month after I got there, he was up for sentencing. He was getting ready to get sentenced. He already had the four year deal set. It already it was pretty much already set in stone. He just had to go to court and you know get sentenced, just sign off on it. That's all he was waiting for. So, you know, understandably, Joe was ready to go. He was ready to get up out of that county. Four years being in that county jail at that time for him was too long. You you can imagine what 10 years did to me. But Joe would ride that, end up riding that same boat. I'm not going to tell you guys how it happened yet, but, you know, obviously you can figure out that the phone calls. The next episode, you guys will understand a little bit more about what happened, how it happened. It's kind of crazy. I mean, I, I hate to say it's funny, but there's parts of it that is kind of funny. It's like, no way did that happen. And you got to be, you got to be dumb stupid or just brainless to fall for the for the banana in the tailpipe like that but it, it from this point on the case just starts to get messier and messier more people start getting put on i get called down to court like another three four five times and every time i go down there there's just they're giving me a new criminal complaint and they're consolidating more people onto the case Pony eventually comes in. He gets consolidated onto the case. I told you guys, bl me, Bling Bling, Roger, and John were the first ones. Then, you know, Pony ends up coming in. He was at somebody else's house when they arrested him. They come in on the case. They get put in on the case, and they weren't even part of the regiment. I don't even know these people, but they get put in on it as well. So they're co-defendants now as well. Other homeboys start getting busted. Sykes ends up getting busted at one point. Now he's a co-defendant. Angel ends up getting, it just continued to snowball, like I told you guys. Anyway, this is a good place to end this one right here. I know for that viewer that says, man, B, I hate it when you say this is a good place to end because we want it to keep coming and keep coming. I know, man, but all good things must come to an end. It's going to get kind of crazy, you know, in the next episode. Because there's a lot that went on and this, you know, what I'm going to talk about in the next episode, it should make some of you mad. But this is the kind of stuff that I had to deal with when I was in that jail. And I'm not trying to play the victim. That's never been me. So don't misunderstand what I'm telling you guys. You can make those determinations or, you know, draw those conclusions yourself. But it's just crazy the things that 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 happened over there and how a lot of homies were in cahoots with it. You know, like they say, the bigger you get, the harder they want to see you fall. Anyways, 
This is episode 35. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll try to get out episode 36 tomorrow. I got a profile that I'm working on that should be dropping in the next couple of days. I also got a tribute that I'm going to be doing for a very well-known homeboy that was near and dear to me. It was somebody that I functioned with in the past that just recently passed away. I'm not going to reveal it right now. I want to finish the tribute that I'm doing for him. I'm going to drop that as well. If you guys got questions for the Q&A, continue to put your questions in the community section and we will find them. Also, I told you guys that there's something that's going to be coming in the next two, three weeks that I'm going to be announcing that's still set for mid-August. So, you know, I, I really want to tell you guys right now, and I'm fighting back all the urges that, you know, that. I'm having for wanting to tell you guys, but I'm just not going to spoil it right now. There's a certain way I want this to come out and I want to unroll it or roll it out a certain way. So I got good things coming up and that right there, that situation should just open up a lot more doors. And from there on, we'll see what happens, you know, but anyways, this episode 35, I hope you guys enjoyed it. This your boy B and I'm out.